In this video, we're going to take a look at the Gin and Juice Shop, which is an intentionally vulnerable website created by Portswigger for you to test the Burp Suite scanner. And why am I making this series? Well, some of you may know that I make videos for the Web Security Academy over on the Integrity channel. And in order to do some of those expert labs, I need Burp Suite Pro because you need that for the collaborator. And I also want to do the Burp certification. So this is a good time to take a look at the Gin and Juice Shop. Also, my channel's dying. I've not made a video in like three months and I need to feed that YouTube algorithm. So I'm on an article here from Portswigger which tells us a little bit about the Gin and Juice Shop. It was designed to test out this vulnerability scanner and it has a lot of common vulnerabilities like single CSRF tokens and XSS, SQL injection, things like that. Here's the link that we need to go to, ginandjuice.shop. But before we do that, let me just talk a little bit about Burp Suite. Somebody mentioned to me recently that there's not really any videos on YouTube that cover Burp Suite in a short amount of time, so they're all like 30, 40 minutes, including one by me. So I'm going to try and do like a five minute intro into what Burp is and how to use the key features. So what Burp Suite is, it is a web proxy. It will sit between us and the website and we'll be able to intercept requests and then either drop them or forward them or modify them. And in order to do that, we first need to set it up. I'm not going to show how to do that. You can set it up manually by going to your Firefox settings and you'll need to set up the proxy so that it actually proxies through Burp Suite. And you'll need to install the Burp Suite certificate so it's allowed to actually intercept those requests. I actually use the Foxy Proxy plugin, which you can see here is disabled at the moment, which means if we go to, let's say Google, that's fine, it just loads. Nothing happens in Burp Suite because it's not currently intercepting our requests. And the reason I like this Foxy Proxy extension is you can just swap between different proxies. So if I now enable Burp and then refresh the page, you'll see that if we go to our HTTP history tab, all of those requests come in and we can actually stop that from happening. We can turn our interceptor on and then if we refresh the page, it will wait for us to take some action. So we can either forward it to Google or we can drop it so it'll never get there. Or we can make some changes. So I could go and add in some information, change one of the headers or something like that and then forward it to its destination. It's kind of annoying because you'll get a lot of different requests showing up here. So I like to just turn this off most of the time and then deal with the requests in the HTTP history, which you can see here. Here's our request on the left and here's our response on the right. So that's the proxy tab and how we use the intercept and the HTTP history. Another key feature is the repeater. So if we right click on one of these requests and then send it to the repeater or use control and R, this will basically send a request here and then we can just keep repeating the request. So I can just keep hit and send and every time it'll send that same request along. And it means if you want to play around with some values here, we can very easily change them, click send, change them again, click send. And why is it good to do this rather than in the browser? Well, it's a lot faster, but also the browser might have some client side validation. There might be a website and it, for example, it makes you put in an email address in the specific format of having like an at and a dot com in it. But if that's a client side validation, we can just send this to the repeater and then we can just go and change that email to anything we want without those checks being done. You can do a lot of other cool things here. So you can also do like a single packet attack for race conditions, but that doesn't need to be covered here. Let's just try and keep this basic. I'm gonna go to the intruder as well. So you can right click this request here or in the HTTP history tab and do control and I or right click and just intruder. And this is like a brute force. So you have different attack types depending on how many payloads you want to use and how you want to process them. The sniper attack will basically just take a single payload here. So let's say that we want to brute force this SSL parameter. Maybe there's some other parameters here which are of interest. Click the add button here and it will add these little icons and we go through to our payloads. And then we can basically say what we want to loop through. So do we want to loop through numbers? Do we want to loop through a word list of useful keywords? Do we want to generate some usernames? So this is great if you want to brute force usernames and passwords, or maybe you've got a potential XSS vulnerability and you want to try different encoded payloads to try and get past a web application firewall. Well, maybe rather than manually doing each one, you just want to automatically brute force through them. So that's the sort of thing we'd use the intruder for. We also have a sequencer, something that I basically never use. I think the only time I've used this is on CTFs or like uh, Portswigger security challenges, but it will basically allow you to analyze the randomness of values like session tokens and things like that. You've got the collaborator, it's only available for pro and basically you can put this address that it gives you if I do copy to clipboard, it'll give me an address. And then if I try to access that address, it will get a hit in here. So you can see poll and we can see that we've had these requests made. So 
This is useful if you want to try and maybe exfiltrate some data. So think like blind exfiltration of data and things like that. And we've got a decoder, so we can decode different types of data. We can also encode them, so like base64, URL encoding, things like that. We've got a comparer, so we can do comparisons on different data. A logger, which is basically just logging all of our requests. And we've got extensions. There's a lot of cool extensions for Burp. You can go to the Burp App Store and have a look at these, look at the popularity and the ratings, generally a good way to rank them. Some of them are only available for Pro, and you can see what sort of impact it'll have on the system. You can also install custom extensions, so you can see that I have some here, some that are Java and some that are Python. And finally, if we go through to our target then, we have the targets here. You can see these are all different websites which are showing up, and we can drill down into the different folders and the files. And you can crawl here, so it'll basically, if we provide a URL, it'll crawl through each link on each page, and then it will populate that tree. And we can do a scan. So you can see here there's a scan. There's actually a passive crawl and a passive audit being done. So anything I try to visit is already automatically looking to see if it can see any vulnerabilities. But you can specifically do a new scan here. And in fact, I'm going to delete these because we only want to focus on the gin and juice shop. I don't want any vulnerabilities or any leaks tokens or anything to be showing up here from other sites I'm connected to. So um, the other thing is we might want to delete these. What I'm actually going to do instead is go and set up the scope because this is particularly important if you're doing anything like bug bounty, you might want to set up a scope here. And to do that first, let's close these down. Let's go to the actual gin and juice.shop. This is the site we're going to be testing and I'm going to use advanced scope control and I'm just going to add exactly that. So gin and juice.shop. It's going to ask if we want to continue sending traffic that's out of scope to the history. I'm going to say we want to stop sending, yes. So there we go. However, that's not gonna remove all the stuff that was already here. So I can now change this filter and say, we only wanna see in scope items. And now we don't see anything, even our in scope gin and juice shop. And I realized that the reason for that is that we removed the passive scan on this page. So it's not actually going to add anything to the target, but that's fine. We're gonna go and do a scan in a minute. The other thing to mention is the HTTP history tab. I'm also going to go here and say we only want to show in scope items. And this will just clean this up. So all we're seeing is the gin and juice shop. If this is a bug bounty target, we're not going to accidentally target some third party site. And let's go back now. Let's go and do our scan. But first of all, I also want to be authenticated. So maybe you want to try and do this two scans to see how this impacts things. But if you do a scan without authentication, you're likely to get less issues. And if you also do an authenticated scan, maybe someone wants to do both and you can let me know in the comments how many vulnerabilities you got for each. And if we had our passive scan running, it would also be great just to go and start scrolling through, having a look at all the different features on here. So we can add products to the cart, we can remove them, we can apply coupons and things like that. In fact, there is a coupon somewhere, I think it was on the email thing down here. So if we subscribe to the email, it will give a coupon. And I also tried the single packet attack race condition on here, which was released quite recently to the Web Security Academy based on James Kettle's smash in the state machine research. It didn't work. So I guess either they haven't updated it to include that, or maybe they just want to focus on things that can be done with the burp scanner, which makes sense as well. Anyway, we're logged in. The username was Carlos and the password was Hunter1. So I'm going to go back to the dashboard. I'm going to do a new scan. And I'm gonna also do a crawl as well. Let's take a copy of this. Let's paste this in. Let's go to the scan configuration. I'll do a balance scan and application login. It's asking for the credentials. Here we'll say this is Carlos's credentials. Okay, I'll click okay. I think that's everything set up. We could also change the resource pool. I don't know whether this will mean it doesn't get as many results. So I'm just gonna leave it at the default for now. We'll click okay. And then you can see this is running now. So we can have a look at the audit items, at the summary and things here. This is likely to take a while, particularly the crawling stage. Perhaps you can do these separately. Maybe I shouldn't have actually removed the passive scan, but oh well, it's done now. Let's leave this running. What I'll do is I will leave it and then speed up the video. So don't worry, my burp's not super fast. I have the exact same speed issues that you do. Okay, it's still running. It's actually been running for about 30 minutes, but what I wanted to do is just jump in and start another passive scan. The reason being, last time that I ran the scan, I came back with some more vulnerabilities. So we have nine issues here, but there's a couple of duplicates. 
But there are some low and some high issues that are missing based on the last scan that I did. So I'm guessing that came from the passive crawl where we were actually going through and testing the functionality. I removed it because it was also crawling all the other sites we'd visit, but we should just be able to go on here and say that we want to use our custom scope. So here's the suite scope. We can basically change this and say that we want to have it audit and crawl. I'm going to do, actually, let's do an audit and we'll say that we want to audit everything that goes through the proxy, the repeater, and not the intruder. Let's just leave it as that. And we're using the burp suite current scope. We can do our configuration. Do we have anything of interest there? I don't think so. So we can also ignore duplicate items based on URL and parameter names. Yeah, I'm going to do that as well. There we go. All right. So we'll have this live capturing, which means we can just go and start actually having a look through the website. Maybe if we search for some products or if we go and add them to the cart and then remove them. Let's go and check stock. Let's add it to the cart. Let's view our cart. And oh, it didn't go to view cart. Here we go. Can we place an order? Okay. Our user is flagged for deletion. Okay. Let's just try a random coupon to see what kind of error we get. Invalid coupon. Great. Let's go to the blog. And we basically want to see what this comes up with. So you can already see that it's come up with five low issues and 23 informational, whereas the scan that we've had running for ages only had the three and the 15. Notice also that this has slowed down even more now as it's come up with more results. So I'll probably leave this running for a little bit longer and we'll go and generate a report shortly. Thankfully, it only took another five minutes or so to finish, and we can see the results here. We've got nine critical issues, one medium, four low, and 16 informational. And we've got some statistics here. So 61 items were audited. We've got 54 unique locations, 43,000 requests, only nine network errors. And as we were going through, it was populating this task log to say what URL it was testing and what vulnerability for. We've got a list of the vulnerabilities here with the most serious being at the top. And we can have a look then at each item that was audited, what kind of issues were found, what kind of scans were run on it. We can have a look at our event log, audit log, live crawl view, all looking good. We've also got our live audit, which has now picked up one severe issue, which was the XML entity injection. Notice that wasn't found in this one. So that was found very quickly from the live audit. And we've also got more informational issues here as well. So I guess before we generate the report and start actually looking at these vulnerabilities, we probably want to try and catch as many of them as possible. Let me go back first of all to the target. I just want to show that now that we've done this crawl and scan, all this is populated. So we can now get a good idea of what the map of the website is. Let me minimize this then. Let's go back. I'm just going to go and do some searches here and just see if there's any functionality we've missed. Okay, there were no results found for that. Let's try and do one that does find something, just in case that comes up with anything different. Let's go and view the post as well. We've got comments here. We can't add a comment though, unfortunately. If we go to our cart, our cart is currently at 576. Okay, let's change the quantity as well, see what that does. Let's try and remove it from the cart. Let's go and add something new to the cart. I'm going to click on this filter as well. This is the sort of thing you might see some like LFI here or something. Okay, let's change location, check stock. We'll add just one of them to the cart. Let's try and use a real, to a real coupon as well, just to see if there's any difference to using an invalid coupon. And apply it. Coupon is applied. Let's also test out the remove functionality and place order unable to process as it's flagged for deletion let's go to our account as well is there anything we can change in here it doesn't look like it maybe we want to have a look at the crawl as well to see if there's any locations that were identified that aren't mapped on the home page so you can see there's an admin page but it's access denied at the moment let's go back then to see have we found anything new back to the dashboard we've now got three issues so just by browsing around for a little bit we have found a client-side template injection, cross-site scripting DOM base, which wasn't found in the scan that we did earlier. And we've got some more medium and, or sorry, some more low and informational issues here as well. So I feel like now is a good time to generate a report. Maybe we'll come across more issues as we go through, and then we can just deal with those as we come to them. But if we want to generate a report, we can right click on our target and then we can go to issues and then report issues for this host. And then we can generate a report in XML or HTML. I'm going to do HTML. Let's include everything. 
And do we want to include this? Yep, that's fine. Here's a list of the issues. We'll just leave them all. Where do we want to save it? I'll just put this to the desktop. You can see I've got a project created just so that we can keep going back to the same burp suite project. But let's just do here then reports and report title, burp scanner report is fine. In fact, no, let's do gin and juice shop. And how do we want to organize the issues? I'm going to do by severity and we want all issues. Summary bar chart. Yep, let's do them all. And that's it. There we go. We've got a report. So we can close this down. Let's go and take a look at it. And there we go. It opens it up. We've got a list of all our high issues and it actually tells you what confidence is. We've got five that are certain, four that are firm, two that are tentative, and there's our total. And then the same here for our medium, low, and informational. Here's the issues. We're going to focus on the high severity first of all. And we'll basically just focus on them in order. I think there'll probably be a separate video for each one of these high issues that we exploit, but maybe when we get down to low issues and informational issues, we might just do a single video to run through each of them because some of these aren't really things that we'll be able to do much with. And another thing to mention is it could be the case that we need to chain some of these issues together. So for example, if you had a look at the January 2024 challenge from Integrity created by Kevin Mizu, it was a new vulnerability that he had found where well, basically the goal was to achieve cross-site scripting. So we had a cross-site scripting vulnerability, but in order to achieve that, you needed to do some DOM clobbering and you also needed to find the client-side prototype pollution in the Axios library, which you could also then class as a low severity. So you basically chain together three things, the client-side prototype pollution, which is in a vulnerable dependency, and then that is used to achieve cross-site scripting with the help of the DOM clobbering. So three different issues that all make up an attack chain. So it might be the case that that is what happens with some of these vulnerabilities as well. It's also extremely typical that we go back here and we now have another three issues that were added. Let me try and report this again. Next, next, next. And by severity, I'm going to overwrite that file that we just created. All issues, including the informational. And we will call it gin and juice shop. I'm not going to keep doing this. Once we have a report, that's fine. After that, we'll just deal with any issues through the Burp Suite itself rather than through the report. But let's just refresh the page here. We've now got another medium issue. I think that was cross-site request forgery was added. So yeah, this is what we're going to base it on. In the next video, I guess we'll start looking for this SQL injection issue, which we can click on here and get a lot of information about how it works, how to remediate it once we've confirmed the vulnerability and some links to some useful resources as well. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. You can let me know, have you already gone through this? Is this something you're going to go through or do you not have Burt Pro, which is probably an issue for a lot of people. But even if you don't have Burt Pro, you can still go and try and find these vulnerabilities and still use a lot of the Burt Suite features. You just can't make use of that vulnerability scanner in the same way. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, as ever, leave them down below. Thanks.